High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. And my guest today is Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt, holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at AEI. He just released a new edition of his book uh, for Labor Day here, appropriately, uh, appropriately releasing for Labor Day, his book, Men Without Work, um, in which he factors in the last six years and the effect of the pandemic and shutdowns on this increasing sector of our society that simply is not showing up for work, uh, any type of work in any capacity. Um, you know, I, I wanted to start out by by reading something that you put in this new introduction to your book, which is, is that today in 2022, American men suffered depression era in employment rates, even though they inhabit the wealthiest and most productive society ever known. And then you say, after the pandemic, we have gone from men without work, this category of people that you've been um, studying, to uh, work without men, by which you mean that there are millions of open job positions open job positions after the pandemic, increasingly chasing fewer and fewer workers. Um, you know, so who are these prime age men who are just simply absent um, from working life? And, and what are they doing instead? What do their lives look like? Well, it's a trend that's been underway for over half a century now. And as uh, it began in the 60s, and uh, it had been underway for two generations when I wrote the first, uh, uh, the first volume of uh, Men Without Work. Now in this uh, second edition, six years later, we see that unfortunately the trend has only continued. We've got 7 million uh, prime age men, 25 to 54 years old, who are out of the job market altogether, neither working nor looking for work. As you'd imagine, when you're talking about 7 million people, you've got kind of some of everybody in, uh, in this large group. Um, they tend to be disproportionately of lower educational attainment, but about 40% of them have some college and maybe almost a, uh, almost a fifth have college degrees. They're disproportionately uh, native-born, uh, foreign-born men uh, of every ethnicity and almost every educational attainment are more likely uh, than their counterparts to be in the labor force or at work. Uh, they tend to be um, they tend to be never married or not married. Uh, family structure is a big predictor for how attached men are to the workforce. And even for those who, uh, even for those who are not married, having kids at home uh, is a big predictor for how likely you are to be involved in the workforce. Uh, it's, it's, we might call it like the provider impulse or something like that. Um, so this men without work problem, unfortunately, has been uh, only building uh, decade after decade. And as you rightly said, we've got late depression uh, level work rates for prime age men in America right now. That unfortunately didn't only begin during the pandemic. If we look at the entire 20th century, uh, 21st century, if we average out the work rates for prime age men, it's a little bit lower than it was in 1940 when the national unemployment rate was uh, almost 15%. Yeah, you point out, and actually, um... The, the longevity of this problem. Oh, well, let's start here, actually. When does this really, I know you, you start with the kind of statistics that we use in 1940. You know, when does this section of society become something that is consistent and not just a, a factor, for example, a, a depression or a really bad recession? You know, when did this start just becoming a part of American life? Well, uh, back, back, in the, uh, back in the depression, uh, the presumption was that if you possibly could, and you were a guy of working age, you'd get a job. Uh, the I, the uh, presumption was that if you were neither working nor looking for work in the civilian population, non-institutionalized, you weren't in jail or in, in the military or something, um, there's a very good reason that you weren't there. They were disabled, incapacitated, uh, some big problem. For the first two decades after World War II, uh, the proportion of prime age guys neither working nor looking for work was negligible, maybe three out of a hundred in this group. Um, 
it was not until the 1960s that this um, uh, kind of uh, stasis, this post-war stasis, uh, started to change, started noticeably to change. And it has been a remarkably steady uh, flight from work for America's prime age man. You know, uh, we all know that things like um, you know, uh, economic and structural change make a big difference in the workplace and demand for labor and all of that. Uh, the, but the strange, the really the uncanny thing about this flight from work is that it's almost a straight line. From 1965 to today, uh, the the proportion of men who have dropped out of the workforce has tripled, more than tripled since 1965. And if you look at that proportion over time, it's almost a straight line. You can't tell when the recessions occurred or when they were boom times. You can't tell when China entered the, uh, the World Trade Organization to disrupt uh, trade. You can't tell about our you know, fascinating little disruptive devices like iPhones. It almost looks like it almost looks like a geological force, and so there are obviously some big, powerful uh, dynamics at work that account for all of this, and they're not entirely well explained by our regular economic, uh, you know, received wisdom. Yeah, I think that's what I find so fascinating about your book and about this subject. Um, you know, we had this huge debate, obviously, and shift, um, especially on the right and how we think about like, like these kinds of issues during 2015 and 2016 when Donald Trump was running for president and really highlighting sort of the deindustrialization, uh, the uh, exodus of manufacturing jobs, right? Um, and we've been connecting the, the sort of deaths of despair and this kind of disconnection from civil society uh, largely to economic factors. And, and here you are saying this really started in 19, in the 1960s. Um, and there's a, there's actually been relatively little impact on the number of, of these men who are just not, they're not in education. They're not um, attempting to, to, um, you know, sort of build a different credential. They're not looking for work. They're just not interacting with the workforce. Um, to me, this is something that really should make us question kind of our, 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 I guess, post-2016 political structure and how we think about politics, because it, it almost makes me think about the, um, th there was a, a essay that Kevin Williamson at National Review got a huge blowback for. And sometimes I think, you know, in some ways fairly, in some ways unfairly, like people, you know, sort of quoting, taking quotes out of context. Um, but one of the things he was essentially asserting is this, this is a choice. Um, this isn't due to these larger economic factors uh, there's something else going on here, and it's not going to be solved by a, a sort of new style of, of industrial politics or by tariffs. Um, so I guess the question I want to pose to you, considering all that, is if if the jobs in Detroit, Michigan came back, the factory jobs in Detroit, Michigan, magically, we snap our fingers, right, they, they're restored to the levels that they were at in 1953, is is this country capable of fielding a workforce that can show up at eight or nine in the morning, work a full day, um, do job training and pass a drug test and, and, and actually engage in, in those kinds of factory jobs the way they could in 1953? It's a profound question that you ask, Inez, and uh, I can give you a partial answer to it because we've had a natural experiment over the past several years that, um, that provides, I think, some insight into this. You know, when I, uh, in, in the first edition of Men Without Work back in 2016, um, one line of objection or criticism was more or less, uh, Eberstadt, you moron, you don't understand. Uh, there aren't any jobs out there. Uh, and, it's harder to make that argument today, as we both know. We're in the middle of an unprecedented uh, peacetime labor shortage. There are over 11 million unfilled jobs in the United States, right? And um, 
they're not all for computer coders and uh, you know hedge fund managers. There's, as you were intimating, there are millions and millions of jobs available for people whose skills are basically to show up on time regularly and sober. Uh, and yet, and yet, despite all of the uh, bargaining power that job applicants have right now during this great resignation that we're in, uh, these men and also now women who are on the sidelines of the economy aren't being drawn back in. Uh, what I would say, or what I'd think about this, is that uh, economic systems are pretty good, especially market systems, are pretty good at solving economic or market problems. But I think what we may face in the uh, manpower situation at the moment is something that isn't entirely an economic problem, isn't a, uh, isn't a question of wages not rising rapidly enough or uh, opportunities seeming sufficiently attractive. For the... Um, one of the things which we've unfortunately noticed over recent decades is that once men fall out of the workforce for some period of time, even if they're in their 20s or 30s, it's hard to get them back in. That's not true for people who are unemployed. They're still in the labor force. They're uh, out of a job but looking for one. Um, but it seems to be very difficult to get um, long-termers, male long-termers back into the workforce. That is not true for women. That has not been as true for women. And we've got this um, fantastic existence proof in our society that people can drop out of the labor force for years and years and go back and be productive because they're called mothers. Um, that, what, what I'm, what I'm saying is that I think we have a sort of a sociological uh, problem that we're we have to confront with the people who have, with the men in particular, who have dropped out of the workforce and whose circumstances or viewpoint or um, particulars have changed in such a way as to be less interested or less capable of returning to paid work. Yeah, I mean, what, so first of all, what, what are these, what are these men doing all day? Um, and I mean, the, the more difficult question is how, because it seems to me to be, if not a cultural problem, even a psychological problem of how to motivate people and part of that story has to be that they're, they're paying their bills somehow. I'm not saying they're living like kings, obviously, but they are finding a way to feed and clothe and entertain themselves. So what are they doing? Well, one, uh, one way we know about what they're doing is by what some of these men tell us they're doing. Uh, the U.S. government collects these annual surveys on time use. I mean, mainly they do this to figure out like when people are going to work and how long people are working for and things like that. But they ask all adults, not just uh, people who are job holders. And the men who are neither working nor looking for work tell us a very consistent story over time. About a tenth of them, maybe a little bit more than a tenth, are out of the workforce because they're full-time students. They're getting training. They're going to get back into the game. But the huge majority of them, uh, the ones who are neither employed nor in education and training, the NEETs, as the Brits call them, the NEETs, um, they paint a pretty dispiriting picture of their own lives. They report that they basically don't do civil society. Um, they don't do much worship or charity or volunteering. They've got lots of time on their hands, obviously, but they do surprisingly little help around the home, you know, cleaning, housekeeping chores, or helping with people in the home. What they say that they do is watch. They say they watch screens. 
surveys don't tell us what the screens are. Surveys don't tell us what they're watching, what the content is. But 2,000 hours a year, sometimes more, uh, as if this were their full-time job. Uh, and the same reports, uh, self-reports, say they're getting out of the house less and less. So we have this picture of people who are, you know, pretty disconnected from society and maybe even from families, totally disconnected from work, um, you know, who are living in screens. And other data tell us that they report, half of them report that they're, half of these men uh, report that they're taking some sort of pain medication every day. It's a... Um, it's almost as if this is a kind of a sort of a training class for deaths of despair. Uh, it's a it's a picture of a certain type of misery, I think, and also uh, clearly a tableau of an enormous amount of wasted human potential. Um, who's paying for this? Well, again, if we look at um, if we look at government uh, numbers, uh, it looks like it's friends and family, uh, meaning. Uh, girlfriends, uh, other family members, and Uncle Sam. Um, disability, uh, disability insurance programs pay for, uh, at least pay some uh, benefits for more than half of these unworking men, it seems. And uh, disability benefits do not provide a princely income, <laughs> let's be clear about that. Um, but they do allow for an alternative to life in the working world, which is exactly the opposite of the original and I think quite noble intention of disability programs, which is to provide for people who couldn't take care of themselves, couldn't, uh, couldn't work. Yeah. It... You know, there's there's sort of this instinct to almost be contemptuous of this. Maybe it's a, a female instinct of being contemptuous of men who aren't applying themselves. I think even more so than the opposite, right? Um, opposite way, a dynamic, like sex dynamic there. But um, the more that I read in, in your book and thought about this and thought about how these, these men are living their lives, it struck me that they're confronting a lot of the same problems that are making all of us kind of go nuts, right? Um, there is this this overwhelming sense that the West has lost its meaning or its purpose or its ethos. Um, and that, you know, maybe some people are responding to it by becoming careerist, right? And and pouring themselves into their work, but but some others are responding by to that alienation, that disconnection, by just not having any motivation at all to, you know, to go out and, and bust their hump at work, right? Because for what? They, they don't have, as you, you say in your book, they are largely un, unmarried. Um, they mostly don't have children, to at least children they take care of in the home or that they have any relationship with. Um, they don't have, you know, a sort of stable family structure. Something is paying for their lifestyle, obviously, but um, they're not attached to churches. They're not attached. I mean, it, it, start, it starts to look very much actually like the problems that I think... Um, you know, a lot of people who are going to work and are participating in society, at least in a more public way, are still confronting. I mean, why why does the West, why does the West, uh, you know, this this problem of meaning in the West really start to happen in the, in the 1960s? Because again and again, um, on, on not just this particular front, but all these other issues that I've been exploring with folks on this podcast, you know, whether that's that's family formation or, or um you know, psychology, problems with psychology, like all this stuff that all seems to draw a line back to, you know, right around 1965. So what is it about the 1960s that that seems to have kind of cut the heart out of the West? Uh, yeah, you, I think you've put your finger on something. Um, you know, in the social sciences and policy community, people are endlessly talking about lessons learned but they very, very seldom talk about lessons forgotten. And I think part of we're, what we're talking about today very much has to do with lessons forgotten. If you are trained in, 
the social sciences or economics uh, nowadays, you have lost the language and you have lost the words for describing things that were perfectly obvious to a man and woman in the street in Victorian England uh, a century and a half ago. And that is the difference between poverty and misery or between uh, what they would have called vice and poverty. And that uh, low income was not necessarily a, uh, a cause of vice or poverty and high living standards was not necessarily a cure for vice and poverty. We're, um, vice and misery. <clears throat> We've never been as prosperous as a society as we are today. We are rolling in money. If we divided up all the national wealth, despite the little dip that we've been having this year, uh, and divided it evenly, every notional family of four would have well over a million and a half dollars. That, that's not what we're lacking. What we are lacking is the... Um, uh, is the internal gyroscopes to give our life meaning with uh, the time that we have. Um, and this also gets back to another problem that, um, that we have with the language that we use today in policy uh, making and uh, policy analysis. Um, there's this mental tick where economists and others uh, automatically call any sort of uh, allocation of free time leisure. Well, that's not true. Leisure has a very particular meaning. Leisure is something that restores you or uplifts you. One can also use free time in ways that degrade you. And it is the, it is the sheer degradation that we see in so much of the men without uh, work contingent that I think really is, um, you know, uh, pulls on our heartstrings. Uh, and, and I think is a, a, is a reason for, for great concern. We trace this back to the 1960s and a lot of things began, or at least we could see a lot of things beginning in the 1960s that are, um, early chapters in the book that we're now living in. Uh, one, of course, was the beginning of the um, revolution in the family, the revolutionary disintegration of family structure, of the former family structure in the U.S. Another was the beginning of the, the rise of the, uh, of the social welfare state, not the Roosevelt state, but the anti-poverty state from the war on poverty in the 60s. We also saw the beginning of the crime explosion then, and um, all of these, all of these factors, I think, kind of uh, were ended up having uh, tremendous corrosion on the order that we took for granted until then. Uh, we're not supposed to talk in value terms, at least in many parts of uh, polite society these days. But it is apparent, it is manifestly apparent, it's screaming out at us <laughs> for the, the evidence of our senses, that people who are not connected to work or to their families or to their faiths or to their communities uh, are not engaged in leisure. They're not, uh, they're not boning up on their Schopenhauer. Uh, they're, as I say, they're in a, there's so many, in so many cases, on, in trainer courses for deaths of despair. And it's, uh, we've had this simultaneous explosion of wealth and explosion of misery in our society that can't be explained unless we take a look at morals, values, and personal ethos. Yeah, this is this is reminding me of the UBI debate, right? Um, and, and I recall at some point Nancy Pelosi, uh, somebody asked Nancy Pelosi, you know, what are people going to do if they like with their time if they don't have to, you know, go out and and, and get a job for a basic standard of living? And she said, well, that that that's the, the wonderful thing, you know, they're going to write poetry, 
Um, and it seems obvious, whichever, you know, I, I've heard some convincing arguments for and against UBI in terms of rejiggering the, the welfare state, but that that is the point where I tune out and kind of roll my eyes at the UBI debate, where th this assertion that if we free people from the constraint of having to earn a living, that there, there's going to be this flourishing of, of um, you know, wonderful art and and uh, community and, and all these things that we sometimes don't have time for because we work a lot. Um, but it seems like obvious just from observation that what's more likely to happen is people fall into despair um, and and they, as you say, they don't use their leisure time for leisure. They use it to degrade themselves, um, to get on drugs, to, you know, um, to stare at screens all day, to consume material passively, um, and not not to actually do this sort of great renaissance of of art and music and um, all the things that we wish we had time for theoretically if we weren't working. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, I guess the the most difficult question, and, and it's not really probably an answerable one, um, but perhaps you can guide us to at the start of how we should start thinking about an answer because. You know, th there's this notion, especially on the right, right? Um, online, it goes by the trad community, right? And and the word return spelled with the, the Roman V instead of the U. Um, and it strikes me that that's incredibly difficult, if not impossible. That, that in fact, as you, you, you talked about the gyroscope inside that, that kind of was, was pointing us almost um, in an unself-aware way in, in, a, in a particular direction. I mean, how do we rebuild gyroscopes in people who don't have them and have never had them? And here I'm speaking of myself as well as the neats, right? Um, you know, people who most modern people who did not, you know, sort of grow up with this default, unself-aware to a certain extent setting. Um, I mean, I, it's not clear to me that you can sort of will that into being um, purely because you see the negative consequences of so many people not having it. So, you know, how do we sort of punch through to the other side or, or is there any hope of punching through to the other side of this kind of modern lack of meaning? Oh, I, th I think there's very much, there's plenty of hope. Um, and, and I think that actually, uh, if we take history as our guide, we've got uh, some, uh, some reason for a, um, cautious optimism. Especially if we take American history as a guide, we see that ours is a history that has been defined and marked by successive great awakenings. Right? Uh, nobody knew they were coming when they were when they were about to burst forth. But uh, I'm part of the particular characteristics of the uh, of the American experience has been a succession of um, religious awakenings, uh, moral um, revitalizations of our economy, of our society that um, uh, did not were not government driven. They came spontaneously from the bottom. Uh, my much better half, Mary Eberstadt, says she'd settle for a small awakening at the moment. And I take her point, uh, but uh, the. The reality of facts on the ground uh, creates new facts, and uh, and a uh, and a moral awakening or response to existing realities is something that um, you know we should certainly uh, you know, be open to. Um, it's also true that uh, the the brute experiences of the life course can change people's perspective on things, whether it's actually getting a job, whether it's becoming a parent. Um, there's so many big uh, points in the life course that can change one's perspective on things. I, I don't think that we should be, uh, you know, I don't think we should be uh, despairing at all about this. Uh, what we should recognize is that uh, is that for unintended reasons, government has been more of a problem than a help with the what we'd call the men without work problem. Um, and during the uh, during the post pandemic era, um, unintended consequences of the emergency rescue uh, programs. Uh, 
had the result of incentivizing millions of people to leave the labor force, and they weren't just our old friends, the uh, the prime working age men. We're seeing some of that now in older uh, American men and women, and maybe some of that in certain categories of younger women. Uh, but keeping, uh, you know, uh, telling the truth and not being afraid to talk about true things, I think is uh, is very much our friend in trying to uh, get through to the other side of the problem, as you were saying. Yeah, I think we are in the middle of a fifth great awakening. I think that great awakening is just not connected to Christianity. Um, I think that's largely what our, our uh, quasi-religious woke folks are really experiencing. Um, so you, you write that because we're talking about these these maladies that I think are not limited to this class, this neat class um, of men. But you note that uh, you, you say in your book, quote, that the needs are not violently threatening civil order. Right. They're instead, as you said, kind of cooping up, cooping up at home. They're courting deaths of despair. Um, is this going to blunt the the sort of push for society to actually confront some of these problems because you say at the same time we're wealthier than we've ever had been it seems like a a smaller percentage of people working has produced so much wealth that they can essentially afford to pay off a larger and larger class of people who are suffering from deaths of despair dropping dropping out of the workforce right um you know, how, how do you worry that this this kind of arrangement can go on functionally? You know, nothing goes on forever, but that it can functionally go on for a very long time because of the obscene productivity of a certain sector of the economy. Um, we essentially we just want to be left alone by the people who aren't make like that. I, I can see that attitude very strongly in Silicon Valley. That's why I think UBI is so popular in Silicon Valley. It's like, let's just write a check. That'll clear our conscience in terms of of this other entire part of our society, um, but and 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 you know we can all go back to our lives making making tons and tons of money. Well, the uh, the UBI um, the UBI siren, as you indicated, and I completely agree with you about this, is a um, it's a false solution. I mean, it's a false solution for a democratic society. It's a false solution for economic malady. Um, it would be a very convenient way of um, funding, uh, funding a vehicle so that the little people would be quiet, go, uh, go back to their uh, television screens and uh, Percocets. Uh, but we've seen we've seen what happens uh, with people who are disconnected from the workforce of working age now uh, and not involved in raising of kids and stuff. Um, and it's not pretty, and I don't think we should want to buy more of it, no matter how expensive or inexpensive uh, that is. Um, we'll um, we're going to. We have seen over the past generation, uh, I think, some very troubling big trends in society that uh, comport with this notion of you know, a new misery. Okay, uh, and it's not just the uh, men who are dropping out of the workforce and the increasing dependence uh, upon government uh, support. Uh, as an alternative to income, and it's not just the decline of the family. I mean, all of these are in it. Um, from the uh, from the time that the Berlin Wall fell until the eve of the pandemic, the uh, inflation-adjusted net worth of the bottom half of American homes didn't budge. This is a 30-year period in which American wealth soared. And the bottom half of the United States, in terms of net worth, was no better off than they had been 30 years earlier. So 
manifestly, there is something in our economic formula that is not working well for a lot of our country. The economic escalator has broken down. And given that big reality, I don't think it's at all surprising that we should see the populist discontent that has risen up in the United States over, let's say, the last decade. Um, more wealth for the wealth holders and less work for the workers is an almost classical framing of an invitation to a sort of a populist um, uprising. Um, what neither political party at the moment really has, from what I can tell, or from what I can see, is an answer to the question of how do you rebuild the escalator for prosperity and success in the United States. You know, the generally speaking, the left has got generally speaking an answer that we'll redistribute our way out of it. But redistributed resources aren't spent the same way as self-earned resources, and they don't make you feel the same way as self-earned resources. Um, some on the right, you know, think about you know, miracle of the market. I'm all for miracle of the market myself. Don't get me wrong about this. Uh, but we, ha I think we have to do something more than that. Uh, we have to do something more than that if we're going to successfully get people back into the updrafts of a, uh, of a dynamic, improving economy. Uh, work first principle would be a very good start on some of this. It wouldn't get us all the way, but it would be a good start. Um, you know, I, I guess, so th there's, there's a little bit of tension then. Um, are you talking about that, that this populist uprising because you're saying that that folks um, are having a harder and harder time getting kind of on an escalator to success, and I I think that's very true. And focus a lot on, for example, education policies and um, mm -hmm. the way that we we heavily subsidize university, and and then end up folks end up with debt. And it, it is sort of a difficult. It's getting harder and harder to get your first that first step on the rung and actually like start to climb up um, the economic ladder, but. At the same time, you're saying that these this particular category of men, you don't see any change in the, the flat line, right? You said it's just it's basically a straight line going up from the 1960s and actually hasn't changed with that that 30 year break that you're talking about where the top half or the top, you know, 10 percent has mm -hmm. broken off so far from from mm -hmm. the bottom half economically. So you're saying these are almost parallel phenomenon then phenomena that that. A populist discontent is rising from essentially the working class. And mm -hmm. then we have this whole other class of people who might be called like the non-working class, right? Um, how, how does all of that interact, I guess, would be my question. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I can give you a, a complete answer to that. Um, I can tell you that um, the storyline of the flight from work over the past now getting on 60 years um, has had different um, stages to it. Um, there was a um, there was a very important crime and punishment stage to it uh, in the uh, in the 80s and 90s and maybe even the 2000s with the an explosive growth of ex-con population, overwhelmingly men in the United States. That's an invisible portion of the story. We had the um, opioid epidemic and the growth in deaths of despair starting in the 90s and uh, going forward, unfortunately, to today. So the different characteristics of this flight, the um, coloration of it, have been different over time. Um, and as far as I can tell, uh, and our, our public opinion polling isn't too helpful with this because most of the public opinion polling asks about your ethnicity and age and gender and almost never asks about your employment status. But as far as I can tell from other stuff, uh, the men without work at home on couches uh, are not terribly politically active. They're uh, inert in other uh, 
areas of uh, the community. I think it looks like they aren't big voters. Um, so they're not the ones who are going to lead the political changes. Um, that's not necessarily true, though, of their family members, friends, people in their communities. I mean, I think that people in communities who have seen some of the blight that has been associated with the misery, uh, the new misery, uh, have been quite active, have been voting. Um, so uh, we're more likely to see um, we're more likely to see people who are aware of this uh, from their communities and their own lives be politically active. One of the unfortunate things about the increasing stratification of um, life in the United States is I think that fewer and fewer political representatives, uh, fewer and fewer of our you know, uh, political figures actually know firsthand uh, from their own families or from uh, their own friendship communities, uh, the realities of this situation. They can read about it, but are much more likely to be surprised by it just because they're personally out of touch with it. Yeah, this is really reminding me of, for example, Tim Carney's work about, um, you know, what the political makeup of like, for example, even within the GOP primary in, in 2015 and 2016, and how people split off sort of the anti-establishment between Cruz and Trump based on various factors. But um, it also solves that, that problem that seems to be perpetually perplexing uh, David Brooks, right, about how people with votes can consider themselves part of the populist revolution, right? Um, that that it, it they're just seeing it happen in their friends and family and in their their social networks. Um, so that while while some of these these folks are politically disconnected as well as disconnected from everything else, their friends and family are essentially angry on their behalf. Um, you know, let's wrap up with 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 the sex factor here. Um, you know, you're focusing on men. Um, you do say that this phenomenon is bleeding over into women as well. Um, the, the phenomenon of not, you know, not mm -hmm. working, not parenting, not, you know, um, mm -hmm. the, the stay at home scrolling kind of phenomenon or life is, is bleeding over into women as well. Um, but how much of this, I mean, family seems to be such a huge motivating factor. And some of the stats that you lay out here, I think, um, and, and correct me uh, because I'm, I'm trying to do it from recall and I probably get it wrong, but that men without or with a high school degree, but no higher degree, or maybe not even without a high school degree are as likely to be working as men with a college degree um, if they're married, for example. I mean, how, how is this? Because it seems like it would perpetuate an ever negative cycle, right? Because if you're, women are not attracted to men who live like this for the most part, right? Um, it goes against very basic female biology, but on, on the flip side, you know, if, especially if these guys are just like zoning out, watching porn or whatever, they, they probably are just exiting the, the mating market as well as all of these other things. So, you know, how, how does um, pairing off, how does marriage, how does sex factor into um, essentially yeah. the dynamics of this, this neat class? Well, as as you um, as you rightly indicate, it's a it's a two way street. It's not all unidirectional. It's a very complicated dynamic. Uh, but at the at the end of the day, um, family structure is a pretty good predictor for whether uh, whether a guy is going to be in the workforce or not, no matter what his ethnicity or uh, his age. Um, or his education. And likewise, having, as I think I mentioned, having kids at home is a pretty good predictor as to you know, the, your level of attachment to the workforce. Um, it's, it's very historically um, unusual for men not to be in the provider role. You might even say it is unnatural for them not to be in the provider role. And uh, and maybe that's all a social construct or whatever, but it's, it's a social construct that's gone on in a lot of different places over an awful long period of time. And uh, for men not to be in that role um, uh, 
ends uh, nowadays ends in some ways that are very unhappy for a lot of men. Um, the question about what what's happened with women in this modern period is also uh, is also really important. Up until about the year two thousand, you could have said that the story. I mean, that women have. Women have always worked. It's just that uh, they didn't get paid for it until after World War II or something. You could have said something like that. And the the story of uh, women entering the workforce was just a, a continuing wave, um, not displacing men, but supplementing uh, men in this workforce. Since about the year 2000, a few years earlier, but let's say at the beginning of the 21st century, the labor force participation for women and the labor force particip participation for men have been going down in lockstep together. So something has happened for both men and women in the workforce uh, and in the economy and society. Something, and this. And this has happened at the same time, by the way, that fertility rates in the United States have been declining, right? Um, what we are seeing now uh, is the rise of a new segment of femininity in modern America, which is the um, prime age woman who is uh, not in the workforce and does not have children at home. Uh, this group has been uh, rising uh, rapidly in numbers, although obviously from a very low uh, initial threshold. And um, especially for those uh, sisters among them who are not currently married, the time use data are showing, I think, warning signs of a sort of a men without work syndrome. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of time, uh, not much time at all, spent on um, you might call uh, civil society. Um, not much time spent on help for others. Um, a lot of time spent in front of screens. So um, I think it is probably uh, too soon for me to be declarative about this but i think there i think there are reasons to um to say that this phenomenon bears watching yeah that and that's that's so sad to hear because it's such a departure from the role of women is particularly in american society as kind of the, the beating heart of of civil society um once i, I recently was just looking at uh because there was of course there were these uh cataclysms of dragging down every statue of every American hero. So I was kind of focused on the statues in small towns that I would drive through or visit or whatever. Um, and it, it struck me that on the bottom of almost every single one of them is erected by a women's group of the town. Mm -hmm. um, almost every single one of, of sort of the public works. Um, and, and of course, women play this role in churches as well. They tend to be sort of uh, women, especially women who had older kids or who didn't have children, who, but who were married. I mean, they were they were the ones doing all the other things, all the, the sort of societal things, the block parties, the, the church potluck, the raising of the town statues, the, um, the organizing of, of contests and stuff like this. This is very much quintessentially American women's contribution to society. So it's it's uh, it's really sad and, and um, depressing uh, sort of trajectory to think about women not using their time in that way and also not working. Um, well, let's say it's just, let's say at the moment it's a yellow light, not a red light, but it bears watching. Okay. Well, we'll continue to watch it. Maybe you will have to come out with a new edition of this book where you, you talk about work without women. Um, but uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining High Noon today. Um, this is Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt. His book is Men Without Work. You, you have a new uh, edition of it with a, a very long introduction dealing with all of the things we've been talking about here in terms of what has happened in the last six years since the pandemic and the shutdowns that has affected uh, this this group very much. I really highly recommend this book. You can go and get it now. It's available since Labor Day. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt, for joining High Noon. Inez, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, 
just before we we sign out here, I just wanted to remind everybody that we have two other podcasts um, that I want to recommend to you from the Independent Women's Forum. The first is She Thinks, which is a, a daily download on sort of policy and, and news of the day with some very great guests. And that's uh, that's hosted by Beverly Hallberg uh, over at IWF. And um, we also have At The Bar, which is myself um, and my colleague, Jennifer Braceres, who runs our Independent Women's Law Center. And we talk about topics at the intersection of law politics and culture. So things like how, you know, major Supreme Court cases, um, we, we've been talking about this, these Title IX regs that just wrapped up, um, the comment period for them just wrapped up, you know, the definition of sex under law. So we're talking about those kinds of topics, and I hope you'll, you'll tune in there. Um, and then finally, as always, thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. And you can send comments and questions to Inez.Stepman at IWF.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. Be brave. We'll see you next time on High Noon.